Welcome everyone to the Department of Classics at Reading. I'm Professor Amy Smith, um, one of the joint heads of department and Barbara Goff is ably in the wings waiting to pick up where I've left off when my internet disappears, which hopefully it won't. <laughs> um, and uh, it's our pleasure, of course, to welcome you back to our department seminar series, um, this term on the theme of making classics better. And uh, today it's our delight to uh, invite another speaker from um, as near as London, um, Holly Ranger. He's an independent scholar and a research associate at the Institute of Classical Studies. Her research interests are feminism, women's writing, critical classics, and her work has appeared in the Classics Receptions Journal, the International Journal of the Classical Tradition, the Ted Hughes Society Journal, gives you another inkling into her um, in her, her, her wide-ranging work. And her first book, provisionally titled Sylvia Plath and the Classics, um, we're looking forward to it appearing in Laura Jansen's Bloomsbury series, Classical Receptions in 20th Century Writing in 2023. Um, something very much um, to look forward to. Uh, if your life is anything like mine, 2023 will come like it's next week or whatever. So um, hopefully for Holly, there'll, there'll be enough time to work on it and her editors, <laughs> etc. Anyway, um, without um, any further hesitation, um, I, um, I would like to turn over to the speaker um, and remind you, please, to turn off your um, microphones and your video while she's speaking. Um, this is being recorded, and um, if you would like to give us any comments um, or especially have questions, um, you can put them in the chat and we'll get to them after she's finished her presentation. Or alternatively, and much better, um, we would love to see you, and it'd be great if you just put your virtual hand up, and um, we'll call on you during the Q&A um, to turn on your micro microphone and hopefully video when you get a chance to speak to us. Okay, so um, over to you, Holly. Welcome, and thank you, and would you like to share your slides? Yeah, hello, everyone. Um, just quickly, thanks so much for inviting me. Um, <clears throat> I've really enjoyed the other papers in the series, so I'm really excited to be here. So, um, look at my slides. Okay, great. Okay, um, so I know a few of you were at Luke Richardson's paper um, on Monday night at the ICS, um, and my paper shares an overlapping concern um, with his for the harms that bad reception scholarship can do. Um, but I wanted to start by giving a little bit of context um, about how this paper came about um, by briefly sketching out the larger project of which it's a part and what I'm trying to work towards with this paper. Um, so about a year ago, a call for papers was issued by Chella Ward at Oxford and Madhura Amachandran at Cornell. And they were inviting contributions from all sub-disciplines of classics, um, so history, philology, linguistics, archaeology. Um, and they wanted to create a space for people who were questioning the frameworks of knowledge formation, the established epistemic frameworks of a discipline known as classics. And what I mean by that is that in our various subfields, there are established ways of thinking and knowing about the ancient world. And these take the form of the categories we use, the demarcations of time that we use, um, the literary tropes that we use, and the narratives that we tell about the ancient world and its reception. But given the history of the discipline of classics, and given the history of the university as an institution, and given the fact of the implication of both in white supremacism and imperialism, these frameworks are all doing ideological work. They're setting boundaries on what can be known and how it can be known. And they're implicated in the structures of power and oppression, um, both within the discipline and beyond and historically and today. Um, so this paper is a work in progress for the Critical Ancient World Studies project. Um, and I'm just so excited to be working with such critical scholars. Um, now I'm a reception scholar um, and I've been bothered for a while about one prevailing narrative in reception scholarship that women writers who engage with ancient texts are revising, resisting or subverting the classics to feminist ends. 
this narrative of subversion has been around since the 1970s um, and it crossed over from feminist literary studies to reception studies in the 1990s and it's been hanging around pretty much unchanged ever since. Um, and as I'll argue in this paper, it's still here because it's useful to classics. It's, it's doing this ideological work. But the narrative of subversion has been adopted uncritically across a lot of reception studies. And it's so dominant that it's now crossed over into public facing scholarship. Scholarship that's leaking disciplinary norms and narratives into public discourse. And at first sight, this might seem great. The public are going to see that classics is subversive and politically relevant. But to invoke Cicero for a moment, who's benefiting from this leaky discourse? So in the paper today, I'm going to use my work on the American poet Sylvia Plath to expose the shaky ground on which this narrative of subversion was built in the 1970s and then briefly situate the flaws of that paradigm within the broader phenomenon of white feminism in much contemporary reception scholarship today um, and actually feminist classical scholarship more broadly. Um, and there is, of course, excellent critical reception scholarship out there being done. Um, so hopefully it's clear in this paper exactly what kind of scholarship I'm critiquing and it's this facile and actually sort of boring and repetitive idea that women engage with the classics and suddenly the classics becomes feminist. Um, and in the interest of full disclosure, um, unless anyone thinks that's, that what follows is a sort of ad hominem attack, I actually use this narrative in my doctoral thesis um, that women's subversive retellings will reawaken the critique of the ancients. Um, and I wholly disagree with it now. So. Uh, Think of it as an hour on the couch with me um, analysing myself. So um, a content warning before we jump in as well. I will be discussing racism and discourses of racism when I talk about class poetry um, and I'll flag that slide when we get to it. So please just mute, mute me for a few minutes um, and I will briefly discuss discourses of sexual violence in the second half of the paper as well. OK, so in 2017, Johanna Hanning identified critical classical reception as a mode of reception scholarship cognizant of the role of Greco-Roman antiquity in the construction and maintenance of entrenched systems of oppression, including racism, colonialism, nationalism and patriarchy. Reception 2.0, she wrote, is characterised by a strong personal voice and an open activist agenda. And she cites Danelle Padilla Peralta's elucidation of the classical poetics of hip hop in the classics in of hip hop and Helen Morales's takedown of classicizing diet regimes in fat classics as examples of this new activist critical classical reception studies. Both of these articles, Hanning argues, not only analyze how an ancient text or motif has been received in modern culture, but they engage in open acts of calling out calling out the scholar peers who have neglected hip hop's classical receptions or calling out the diet industry for invoking the authority of Hippocrates. Yet while Padilla Peralta takes care to contextualise the ways in which Jay-Z's classicism actually cuts against the grain of a tradition of socially conscious hip hop in which classical illusions have typically functioned as a metonym for white hegemony, Morales's paper appears to take as read the intrinsic authority of the ancient text it cites, even if it argues for these authorities to be, quote, selectively chosen. But there's a fundamental difference between the two articles, one of which uses reception to critically reflect back at the discipline, and the other which uses reception to protect big C classics from what are frequently termed misappropriations of Greco-Roman antiquity. And I think it can be located in the difference between black classicism and its scholarship and the bourgeois whiteness of much feminist classicism and its scholarship. The difference between the capacity to wholly reimagine what the classical tradition is and who it belongs to and the will to power of white feminism expressed in the desire to claim daddy's authority for oneself. And I use white feminism here and throughout the paper not as an essentializing category, as in the feminism of white women, um, although it is a Venn diagram, um, but following Sarah Ahmed to summarize a relation to the discipline. So that is to describe a feminism that is concerned with protecting the discipline's reputation and not rocking the boat. 
An expanded version of Fat Classics is included in Morales's recently published Antigone Rising, The Subversive Power of the Ancient Myths. Her title speaks to a scholarly paradigm predominant in one strand of this new activist reception scholarship, and it's the one with which this paper will be concerned, the narrative of the subversive power of Greco-Roman literature to somehow undo the ideologies with which it has been traditionally associated. And although the narrative of an appeal to the classical past as a revolutionary gesture has a genealogy parallel to the narrative of classicizing conservatism, the 20th century incarnation of the narrative of subversion has its roots in second wave feminist literary criticism and its claim that women writers whose works engage with Greco-Roman literature rewrite, revise, resist and subvert the patriarchal literary canon. Um, and the touchstone essay is Adrian Rich's When We Dead Awaken, Writing as Revision. This claim has been widely assumed and adapted in 21st century reception scholarship, not only for discussions of women's classical receptions, but also, for example, for working class receptions of ancient literature, which is similarly schematically framed as resisting and subverting culturally hegemonic texts. So, for example, the People's History of Classics does this. The narrative of subversion has been so widely adopted in reception studies, in part because of its utility to a discipline under pressure to demonstrate its relevance to contemporary revolutionary politics and thereby distance itself from its historical and ongoing associations with conservatism, patriarchy and the political far right. And I want to be clear at this point that it is not my intention nor my purpose to invalidate readings of ancient texts and culture that have rejected received interpretations to recover queer lives, trans lives or black lives in the ancient world. What is concerning is the way that the narrative of the subversive power of ancient texts is deployed as a defensive move to innocence. And here I follow Eve Tuck and Wayne Yang. A move to innocence is a strategy or positioning that attempts to relieve the classicist of feelings of guilt or responsibility without giving up power or privilege, without having to change much at all. In fact, classical scholars may gain professional kudos or a boost in their reputations for being so sensitive or self-aware. Yet moves to innocence are hollow, they only serve the classicists. Moreover, this move to innocence is used, consciously or unconsciously, to repeatedly derail the conversations, most often raised by young scholars of colour, about the very real implication of classics in white supremacism and imperialism. Danny Bostick, in a paper from last year, delineating a typology of such anti-revolutionary responses to criticisms of classics, has described this move to innocence as a counterproductive counter-narrative. So something bad happens, let's all tweet about why we love classics. And Nadira Hill has identified this deflection as whataboutism, the technical practice of responding to an accusation or difficult question by making a counter accusation or raising a different issue. So something bad happens in classics, but what about this subversive reading of Catullus? And I'm also particularly concerned or interested in the ways in which this narrative of subversion is deeply implicated in neoliberal narratives of empowerment, in which, as Sivan Anden identified, communal political liberation has been substituted by personal liberation. As I mentioned in my introduction, the narrative of subversion and its valency has persisted since the 1970s and is now embedded as a scholarly trope. And it's my argument here that the narrative of subversion has been institutionalized in reception studies because it is in effect depoliticizing, functioning as a get out of jail free card for a business classics, which continues at the institutional level fundamentally unchanged. With its epistemological and methodological frameworks and thus its implication in wider societal oppressive structures, untroubled. It's a reformist narrative, not an abolitionist one. And Luke Richardson has written powerfully in the CUCD bulletin about the ways in which classics absorption of its own critique has rendered reception studies to little more than the propaganda wing of the discipline. To build a better classics and a more critical classical reception studies, we must undertake an intersectional reassessment of all the disciplinary foundations from which we work. And so, to understand in greater detail the ideological work that this narrative of subversion is doing, I'm going to reassess the foundations of this narrative rather literally by returning to the work of one of the first women to whom this narrative was applied, the American poet and novelist Sylvia Plath. 
by paying attention to the literary, institutional, pedagogical and ideological context that framed Plath's encounter with Greco-Roman literature. I'll challenge the narrative paradigm of subversion with a historicised narrative about value, canon formation and acculturation in the late 1950s. As examples, I'll analyse Plath's series of Virgilian B poems and I'll draw out the elements of the poem that a white bourgeois gaze must overlook to make its claim for the proto-feminist subversive power of Plath's classicising poetry. And I'll then look at the persistence of this white bourgeois feminism and its occlusions in contemporary reception scholarship before closing with some suggestions for a future reflexive critical reception scholarship. So for those unfamiliar with her, um, Sylvia Plath was born in Boston, Massachusetts in 1932. She majored in English at Smith College before reading English at Newnham College, Cambridge. She died in London at the age of 30 in 1963. And when her collected poems were published in 1981, she became the first person to be posthumously awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry. Plath was a brilliant but problematic writer. She is best known for her semi-autobiographical novel, The Bell Jar, and her two collections of poetry, The Colossus, published in 1960, and Ariel, published in 1965. And she is credited with significantly advancing the genre of confessional poetry. Um, she's most often lined with Robert Lowell and Anne Sexton. Ariel has been canonised in the feminist literary tradition, in part because of its daring and intensely subjective engagement with classical myth. And it's some of the Ariel poems that I'll be discussing today. I'm going to begin with an overview of Plath's educational and social introduction to classics. And this is a recognisable trope of much reception scholarship but I reject the way that these educational narratives are often presented as neutral, as if everyone learns Latin in the same unmediated way. And I also reject how these narratives usually serve to demonstrate the classical credentials of the receiving subject. And so instead, I'm doing this to provide an overview of Plath's educational and social acculturation into classics. In 1955, Plath won a Fulbright scholarship to read English at Newnham College, Cambridge. The English Tripos was introduced as a discrete honours degree at Cambridge in 1917 as part of a wider university enterprise in the early 20th century to expand the university's bachelor's degree awards from mathematics, theology and classical philology. The 19th century Cambridge syllabus had been shaped, as Christopher Stray has demonstrated, by the curricula of the elite public schools, which supplied Cambridge with a stream of boys trained predominantly in ancient Greek and Latin. A university syllabus which simply required more of the same at degree level ensured success for these students. And the persistent influence of the public schools on the Cambridge syllabi of the 20th century is detected in the first principles of the two compulsory comparative elements of the modern two-part English tripos instituted in 1926, which acclimatise the elite student to English literature. The tragedy paper begins with the ancient Greek dramatists Aeschylus, Sophocles and Euripides, and the English moralist paper begins with the ancient Greek philosophers Plato and Aristotle. The ordinances of the new degree course held an explicit aim to situate English literature as an inheritance of the Greco-Roman classics, and it was underpinned by an assumption of the existence of an inherited trans-historical canon of works and genres. The privacy of the classics in the new English tripos was reinforced by the prominence of ancient Greek tragedy in the aesthetic theory of one of its first teachers, I. A. Richards, known for his development of practical criticism and his early espousal of the new criticism. And indeed, it was the work of the new critics in the United States, Cleanth Brooks and Robert Penn Warren, which had structured Plath's formal introduction to criticism as an undergraduate at Smith. When Plath arrived in Cambridge in 1955, the tragedy and practical criticism papers were associated with Richard's contemporary and fellow proponent of the new criticism, F.R. Leavis, whose lectures Plath attended. The new critics, heavily influenced by the essays of T.S. Eliot, held a criteria for classic literature, which relied on the acceptance of a shared canon of literature stretching back to ancient Greece and against which individual quality could be measured. The subjective aesthetic value judgments of the new critics were therefore expressed as an assessment of a text placement in this purported tradition of texts, objectively paradigmatic of the human situation. 
And so they were united by a acute conservatism that reinforced the cultural hegemony of the classics. And so we see here how both syllabus and pedagogy combine and how the canon is this iterative process continually remade in teaching and criticism. And it's also impressing upon the young Plath that classicizing poetry is just what good poetry is. Plath's letters home to the US from Cambridge in her first year as a Fulbright scholar frequently expressed an anxiety about finding herself in a cultural and critical environment, which assumed a shared knowledge and valuation of the classical canon. A few weeks into Michaelmas term, Plath writes, quote, my enormous ignorances appall me. Grace is said solemnly in Latin, and everyone seems to have a classical background or to have already picked up Greek. Plath cringes at, quote, having never read the classics and shockingly enough never touched, end quote, the ancient dramatists Aeschylus, Sophocles or Euripides. And her main concern, she continues, is that she, quote, must appear rather uneducated to her director of studies among Unum's classically educated upper middle class grammar school girls. Plath's complaints draw our attention because she had read Aeschylus' Agamemnon in translation at high school and again at Smith for a paper on modern tragedy in the classical tradition. So Plath's anxieties may be located in a perceived lack of grounding in the ancient languages themselves, or perhaps in her perceived ignorance of the European, quote, big air quotes, canon. Um, but they reveal a complicated nexus of desires, both to learn and to assimilate. Plath read steadily and widely to remedy, she says, the disparity between her, um, her American education and the knowledge required for the tragedy paper. And she laments in her journal that her American literary education counts for nothing in Cambridge. By the end of her first year, Plath had read her way through four lecture series in the history of tragic theory and the tragic genre from Aristotle and Aeschylus to Eugene O'Neill. She had also read all Plato and Aristotle for the English Moralists paper. All seven extant plays by Aeschylus and a great deal of Sophocles and Euripides. And Plath also took the opportunity to see two performances of Greek tragedies, attending a production of Sophocles' Philoctetes and the Cambridge Greek play in 1956, that year a performance of Euripides' Bacchae. This is a quote from Plath, in Greek, exclamation mark, performed here every three years, even Oxford gave up plays in Greek in 1932, exclamation mark. In contrast to that effusive letter written shortly after she had seen the Greek play, only a few months later, Plath is coolly alluding to the play to two American correspondents as a cultural highlight of her time so far in Cambridge. And she writes, cultural life better than NYC. After six months in Cambridge, Plath's anxious epistolary positioning as one lacking a classical background has transformed via an ingenuous enthusiasm into a self-presentation as a casually sophisticated elite student, fully assimilated into its classicizing culture. In February 1956, Plath had also met the man who would become her husband just four months later, the future poet laureate Ted Hughes. Hughes had studied archaeology and anthropology at Pembroke College, Cambridge, and was part of a circle of young Cambridge poets heavily influenced by myth, mysticism and anthropology, and particularly the work of Robert Graves and James George Fraser. While Plath's education at Cambridge had focused on Greek texts, Hughes's early classicism was more Roman. He had studied Latin at school. His second poetry collection published in 1960 would be titled Lupercal, and his first translation in the late 1960s would be Seneca's Oedipus. Plath soon aligned herself with Hughes and the Cambridge poets. They felt dissatisfied with the contemporary post-war British poetry scene, and they positioned themselves against the Oxford movement poets in particular, poets such as Kingsley Amos, Amos Tom Gunn and Philip Larkin. The distinction that Plath draws in her journals and letters between the poetry she and her husband were writing and that of the movement poets centres explicitly on their respective uses of myth. As unlike the Cambridge poets, the movement poets had rejected myth. So Plath's classicising impulse was now additionally reinforced by a wish to assimilate to this Hughesian mythopoetics. Plath's creative response to her Tripos reading and her immersion in this culture of classicism 
can be traced through poems written at Cambridge, such as Conversation Among the Ruins, which responds to elements of the production of Euripides' back eye that she'd seen, to later poems such as Electra on Azalea Path, Lesbos, Medusa, and also what are commonly referred to as the kind of the tragic heroine poems, poems such as Aftermath, in which Mother Medea in a green smock moves humbly as any housewife through her ruined apartments, and Perda, uh, which ventriloquizes Clytemnestra, a shell unloose, the lioness, the shriek in the bath, the cloak of holes. Plath's poetic innovation in many of these poems is to temper the conservative impulse of the poem's modernist mythic parallels, impelled by her new critical training in classic, classicising poetry, with an autobiographical eye that resists the subjective effacement and alienation that cultural hegemony, the legitimising tradition, can effect. Plath's celebrated cycle of bee poems in the collection Ariel, to which I'm now going to turn, captures this essential tension in her classicizing poems between a conservative classicizing impulse and a burgeoning impulse towards subjective lyric expression. And at the same time, they allow us to see clearly what must be ignored to maintain class status, both as a subversive resisting rewriter of myth and as a feminist literary form of them. Plath's manuscript version of her poetry collection, Ariel, left on her desk when she died, closes with a sequence of five B poems, written over five days in October 1962, a few months after the breakdown of her marriage to Ted Hughes. Um, they're titled The Bee Meeting, The Arrival of the Bee Box, Stings, The Swarm and Wintering, and they ostensibly form a narrative which describes the speaker's initiation into beekeeping, her receipt of a hive, the bee's assault on a great scapegoat, the flight of the queen bee in search of a new hive, and the winter hibernation of the bees. In addition to the poem's biographical allegory, the bee poems are typically read as a metapoetic sequence on the workings of pregnancy or poetic inspiration. And this is one way of talking about their racial politics. Um, and as we read these poems, keep in mind that racial segregation in the US did not end countrywide in law until 1964, over a year after Plath's death. According to one biographical tradition, Virgil, like Plath herself, had a beekeeper father. But the links between their works extend beyond the personal. Each of the five poems of the sequence correspond to a section of Virgil's fourth Georgic, and they holistically rework his use of the bee society as an allegorical figure for civil strife for an account of a domestic breakdown. Direct points of allusion include the repeated references to the Latin language, Rome, Romans and Caesar. Um, and see, for example, the description of the old queen and her attendants in stings, which follows the Latin closely. Um, Plath has her wings torn shawls, her long body rubbed of its plush, and the honey dredgers who thought death was worth it. And I've got Virgil as a comparison on the right. But I'm actually not so interested in the direct allusions to Virgil as I am in the discourses of classicism that are running through the poems and how they intersect with and are doing the work of discourses of racism. The poem's elusive intertextuality works as often retrospectively as it functions to progress a theme through the sequence. So in the opening poem, The Bee Meeting, for example, the speaker is handed a face covering by the village beekeepers, quote, a fashionable white straw Italian hat and a black veil that moulds to my face. They are making me one of them. The scene is hallucinatory, suggestive of an initiation ceremony, and it seems as if the speaker is being assimilated her individual identity effaced by her costume, a white hat to match the villagers, white shop smocks, white suits and cheesecloth beekeeper suits. But as we read forward in the bee sequence, the colour black becomes exclusively associated with the bees. And so the black veil that moulds to her face in the opening poem is a mask, which now retrospectively marks the speaker as a member of the hive. Black and white are key words in Plath's B sequence, occurring 14 and 11 times respectively across the five poems. But they also appear alongside clusters of words evocative of or nomically associated with the two colours. Um, so for black, we have variously dark hives, dark cellars, a funeral veil, a black bat, and I will return to this, African hands. <laughs> 
And for white, read snow, ivory, the moon, lilies, silk, cheesecloth, cow parsley, blossoms, asbestos, porcelain, and I'll return to this too, Tate and Marl sugar. In the two lines from the bee meeting quoted above them, the poetic speaker's subjectivity shuttles, as it does across the sequence as a whole, between an identification with the white villagers associated in the poems with Caesars and smaller figures of authority, such as the beekeeper and the bees who are explicitly racialized. In the fourth poem of the sequence, Stings, the speaker's identification with the bees is at its strongest. I stand in a column of winged and miraculous women, she says, and the flight of the queen bee in the final two verses of the poem on screen here are typically read in Plath scholarship biographically. That is as a metaphor for Plath's poetic triumph after the breakdown of her marriage only a few months earlier. Um, and these final verses are commonly read as alluding um, to Clytemnestra and or Medea, um, particularly the invocation of the, the lioness. Um, and now she is flying more terrible than she ever was um, over the mausoleum, the wax house. Um, and yet the reference to the red comet there, red scar in the sky, red comet, coupled with the use of that over signified word mausoleum, suggests that even at the strongest point of identification with the bees, the speaker remains a Caesar figure and her alignment with the bees is cast in doubt. This poem stings also reveals that the speaker's locus of identification with the bees is their shared domestic drudgery. And as Wilkinson reminds us, the male poet's pastoral idyll in Georgics is, quote, signalised by the astonishing absence of any reference to slavery. In Stings, Plath implies that the male poet's idyll has come at the expense of the woman's cultural starvation and domestic labour. Um, and she says in that poem, for years I have eaten dust and dried plates with my dense hair. The images of enslavement throughout the sequence are used to foreground the woman, who Plath implies is the necessary yet unspoken condition of Hughes's pastoral paradise. And given the bee's explicit association elsewhere in the sequence with, with blackness, Plath's metapoetic identification with the figure of the enslaved here is drawing on a history of privileged women co-opting and downplaying racist oppression in their comparisons of women to slaves. Um, and Angela Davis has documented how this metaphor was born out of the racism of the white women's suffrage movement in the US, um, which opposed the enfranchisement of black men before white women. And yet, at the moment at which the speaker identifies explicitly with the bees, the word black, the word with which the bees are predominantly associated in the sequence, disappears, replaced with the word women. And plus erasure of race in this middle poem to facilitate an identification with the bees contrasts with the poems which bookend the sequence, in which the speaker and the colour white is pitched against the bees and the colour black. In the bee meeting, she is a pillar of white in a blackout of knives. And in wintering, the final poem, the bees are a black mind against all that white. OK, and so this is the next slide where I dig into the racist discourse further. Um, so if anyone wants to mute me for a couple of minutes um, and I kind of talk about how classics is, is doing the heavy lifting of racism in, in this next poem. So in the poems in which the speaker's identification with the bees is at its weakest, the white speaker is also explicitly in control. And the arrival of the bee box allows us to examine this race and gendered power dynamic in more detail. Um, and I've highlighted some key lines on the slides here. Um, the kind of the Roman mob are these kind of um, Latin allusions. I lay my ear to furious Latin. Um, I'll just come back to those in a bit more detail. So just as black disappeared from stings to align the woman with the enslaved bees, in this poem, the colour white disappears, aligning the speaker with an apparently unracialized male power. At the same time, the black bees receive the sequence's most explicitly racist characterization. Plus use of African hands to describe the speaker's first sight of the bees might remind the reader of Virgil's own African bees, the Carthaginians, compared to bees building a new city for the queen bee Dido when Aeneas first catches sight of the city at Aeneid Book One. Like the speaker of Plath's poem, 
Aeneas stands marvelling at the great din, the strepitum emitted by the workers, uncertain whether he meets friends or enemies. But the din here is described as unintelligible. A furious mob is a muttering protest which are characterised as noise against syllables. And it's a racist trope, reinforced by the use of a derogatory slang term. Although the beekeeping term swarmy is still used today to describe the propensity of different bee species to swarm, its use here as a 1950s slur is made unequivocal by its pairing with the phrase African hands and the accompanying allusion to the middle passage. The bees are clambering in a coffin and shrunk for export. So this is the hive as boat. And this is retrospectively further emphasised by the final poem's reference to Tate and Nile sugar. Tate and Nile here functioning as a grim metonym for the sugar plantations towards which the enslaved are headed. And so the Virgilian allusion in this poem is, is doing the work of racism. While the B poem's use of black and white evinces Plath as a poet produced by the racial politics of the 1950s US, and perhaps superficially aware of a need to engage with it, the speaker's consideration of the other and her relationship to the other, the Roman mob, is only ever in so far as it comments on herself, her self-construction, her self-definition, her power, her whiteness. The power dynamics of race and gender are focalised in this poem in the line, I am not a Caesar. The line may represent the speaker's attempt to recuperate a female subjectivity, but at the moment, she seems closest to recognising her role in oppression, they can die. She hides behind another classical illusion. Quote, I wonder if they would forget me if I turned into a tree. So at the moment, she seems closest to recognising her role in oppression. She transforms into Daphne, the er victim of Ovid's metamorphoses, and she points to the white male as the greater oppressor. I am not a Caesar. And this is a crucial moment in the poem, and it really speaks at what I'm trying to get to in this paper, the way that she can just slip into the classics to her own advantage. In Plath scholarship, the speaker's claim I am not a Caesar has been taken at face value, but the line seems heavily ironic, proceeding as it does both the speaker's recognition that they can die, I can feed them nothing, and the ambivalent statement that comprises the final line of the poem, the box is only temporary. It is also undercut once we understand the classicising imagery in these poems by the speaker's Caesar-like assassination in the opening poem, Pillar of White and a Blackout of Knives, and her Caesar-like apotheosis as a red comet in Stings. The reference to Caesar may thus leave room for the poetic speaker to display a degree of self-awareness about her self-deception that her feminist readers have lacked. And so the poetic speaker's irony is further undercut by the poet Plath's acknowledgement of the corrupting quality of this classicising gesture, a conscious alignment with cultural conservatism and white male power that bolsters the racial hierarchy between the speaker and the bees. And briefly, I want to compare the bee poems um, with one of Plath's most infamous poems, Daddy, um, which I was putting with in my opening paragraph, because the same mechanism is at play here in the way that the speaker co-ops racist oppression here of Jewish people to position herself vis-a-vis -vis male power. And it's also the poem in which the very recent history of classicism erupts. Um, if we remember, Plath was born in 1932 and she, she was 13 when the Second World War ended. And so she has a very fresh memory of the optics of classicism and fascism. And they're explicitly paired in the figure of Daddy in this poem, who is both another Caesar, the Colossus of Constantine, marble heavy, ghastly statue with one grey toe, and a Nazi, a man in black with a Mein Kampf look. I think this speaks to what Plath is doing with her classical allusions. And I think it supports my interpretation of how classical allusion is functioning in Plath's poems that it's a power play and a knowing alignment with power at the expense of racialized others. Every woman adores a fascist. This isn't a misappropriation. And I think there's even room here to claim that Plath is far more aware of the male hegemony underpinning the entire reception project than her critics have been. The cultural power that Plath has been taught the classics hold is personified across these poems in the dominating and volatile presences of Caesars. But for all her recognition of the lethality of patriarchal oppression and for all her ironising of her enthralled relationship to it and daddy, 
In her use of Virgil's text to bring order to the chaos of a broken marriage, and assert herself as a poet, in her place and time and with her educational history, Plath ultimately aligns herself with Daddy. The reader cannot square the claim for the B poems as a proto-feminist revisionary poetic rebirth with the speaker's knowing intoxication with racialized power and her co-optation of the racist oppression of others in her attempt at self-representation. So I return to the late 1950s to demonstrate, I hope, how an understanding of the literary, institutional, pedagogical and ideological context that framed Plath's encounter with the classics reveals a confessional narrative of acculturation rather than one of subversion. In contemporary texts that employ the narrative of subversion, however, the validity of this narrative's premise is assumed and never demonstrated. Moreover, the schematic nature of this narrative entails, even openly calls for, selective sampling to maintain its central proposition. And so its methodology is further undermined by its positivism and confirmation bias. But here's the primary ideological work that this narrative is doing. And that is, in lacking a careful consideration of the iterative processes of canon and value formation, the narrative of subversion serves to reify a stable, trans-historical, universalizable, inherited tradition that contains an intrinsic and unproblematized cultural authority that exists to be subverted and then harnessed by the feminist reader. And so in this, we also see that implicated within the narrative of subversion is the neoliberal narrative of empowerment, a self-help model of individual change that is, as Paul Gilroy has identified, an ideological remnant of Thatcherite conservatism, one that functions to leave systemic structures of oppression happily in place. The nature of this empowerment is most often modelled as a girl boss feminism in which power is associated with the mastery of elite male texts. The narrative of subversion is thus undermined by its own cultural conservatism and reification of the canon, and I think it fails to be radical in its suggestion that the path to female empowerment is via an embrace of elite white cis male culture. It's also never really outlined how exactly women's control of cultural authority will be distinct from the ways in which patriarchy already oppressively wields cultural and discursive power. And in calling on women to reclaim and subvert the classics of personal empowerment, we've forgotten Shelley Haley's use of the term reclaiming in her essay, Black Feminist Thought and the Classics, in which empowerment comes not from mastery of the master's tools, but from unlearning and relearning. Returning to and uncovering the unsound premise upon which the narrative of subversion has been built also allows us to see, even in classicising poems such as Plath's, which explicitly foreground and weaponise difference, the narrative fails to take account of the structural oppressions of race and class as they intersect with gender. And the persistence of this narrative of subversion is symptomatic of the broader problem of white feminism in much feminist classical reception scholarship today. So let's think briefly about one example that recurs across feminist scholarship um, from reception studies to the pedagogical literature. Um, and that's the tale of Philomela from Ovid's Metamorphoses, um, who is raped and has her tongue cut out. Um, but they also manage to kill um, the rapist's son and feed him to him. Everyone dies. Each treatment of the tale rehearses the argument that myths of sexual violence can be read against the grain by a subversive feminist reader. I've always felt uncomfortable with this argument because in order to discover the subversive power of these tales, you often need to be primed with a significant academic framework. The feminist pedagogue must teach her student or reader how to read the tale the right way. And so smuggled into this argument is the suggestion that if you find the tale of Philomena bleakly disempowering, it's because you're reading it wrong. And so the feminist literature advocates a kind of lean in philology underpinned by the fetishization of philological expertise. And when the tale of Philomela is invoked as a feminist revenge fantasy, that claim is underpinned by a carceral feminist desire for power and punishment, a desire that fails to understand the ways in which, as Angela Davis reminds us, individual emotions are inscribed by the retributive impulse of the state and the white supremacist prison industrial complex. The scholarly treatment of the tale of Philomela illustrates perfectly both white feminism's alertness to sexualized threat over racism or classism, 
and its desire to shift into personal power dynamics rather than systemic oppressions. Because it is always passed over, the fact that the only rapist punished in the metamorphoses is the one explicitly racialized. And it fails to recognize that while the individual Terrius is punished, the epic poem remains structured by the gender norms of the patriarchal society in which, as Lynn Interlin observed, the act of rape interpolates the feminine subject. One last thing. In reception scholarship, the purposive sampling conducted in the search for empowering subversive formulas has led to the celebration of texts that, as Amy Hines has identified, are better characterised by their bad feminism, read white feminism, than their subversive use of the classics. The confirmation bias of much of this work also leads scholars to overlook emotionally ambivalent and politically complex works of reception such as Sandeep Palmer's Eidolon, which maintains throughout a critical and self-reflexive hyper-awareness regarding the harms of the cultural hegemony with which it engages in its reflection on the concepts of Western civilization and inheritance as they intersect with colonial, familial and educational histories. Indeed, Palmer's Eidolon brings the compromised stance of the feminist reception scholar into focus. For despite some concessions in the literature to the ways in which classics has been retrospectively instantiated as the beginning of a purported Western civilization, the scholarship almost uniformly fails to critically analyse the scholar's acculturation into this iterative process of canon and value formation, and then her complicity in the reproduction of this cultural and discursive power. So the continued appeal to the paradigms of revision and subversion as a move to innocence, and without a critical reflection on the discipline and its history, at this critical moment when classics is being problematised on all fronts, ultimately works only to assuage the cognitive dissonance of the feminist classicist herself, conscious of her presence in a discipline that continues to be enmeshed in white supremacy and misogyny. So reception 2.0 must begin from a critical self-reflection on the scholar's own shaping by processes of acculturation into patriarchy, into whiteness, by the discipline itself and by the social discourses of classicism to which we have like Plath, like Palmer, been exposed and which we may even be continuing to uphold. And as Carol Azuma Dennis cautions us, it is possible that this might not feel empowering. And then we have to begin to do reception in a way that disrupts rather than reifies the discipline of classics, because a truly critical reception scholarship is not one that uses reception to derail conversations and to prove how subversive classics really is, but it's one which actively disrupts and dismantles big C classics. Um, and so I've put some ideas on the screen here. Um, maybe we can talk about these some more, but I think as a baseline, we need to question all the disciplinary narratives and paradigms that we work with. Um, we need to account for cultural hegemony and acculturation. Um, as I say, use reception studies to disrupt and dismantle classics. Um, use your case studies to problematize notions of authority, value and inheritance. These are iterative processes, not intrinsic. Um, and you can also use your case studies to offer historicized narratives of canon and value formation. And I've tried to offer a model in this piece. We can also use cross cultural reception scholarship, not to prove, but to disprove the universalizable relevance of classics. Um, and Luke's paper on Monday talked about the kind of way that reception studies cannibalizes um, more and more um, receptions. Um, be reflexive and reflexivity is central to indigenous research methodologies. Um, and as Danny Bostick says, stop producing counterproductive counter narratives. And um, just a little shout out to the, the papers that are kind of sitting behind um, my presentation here. Um, and if you haven't read them before, I urge you all to go and read them um, and kind of think about some of the ideas um, today. <laughs>